We're continuing our trudge through the Messier catalogue and today I'm going to talk about Messier 26. Trudge? <laughs> Sorry, our canter through the excitement of the Messier catalogue. Our voyage of exploration. <laughs> oh, right. Yes, you know, maybe that was a little too down market. <laughs> today I've chosen Messier 26. Um, why have I chosen this one? Essentially because it kind of fills in a gap. I was looking at the website that's got all the videos we've done so far. Um, and you know there are some bits where we've almost completed a run. It's in the middle of a line, yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a series of four in a line, and this is and, and actually I did M25 pretty recently, and this is M26, the next one along. It's yet another open cluster. There are many in, indeed of them. Here's a nice picture of it. It's that one in the middle there. Is what not we're looking a, at. Not a standout. It's not particularly inspiring to look at. I have a, a, a closer up view of it. Here you go. There it is in slightly closer closer view. It's another of these open clusters, if you, so we can play the usual games of looking at the properties of the stars in it. It turns out it's about uh, 90 million years old, it's about 5,000 light years away. It's actually one of the ones that Messier himself discovered, because some of the things in the Messier catalogue are just things that he, other people had already discovered and he kind of gathered them together. This is actually one that Messier himself found. A few hundred stars in total. They are probably fairly three-dimensional shapes, so it probably is roughly spherical, fairly messy arrangement of stars, but it's not, it's not flat in the plane of the sky. Um, it probably is just a kind of a, a fairly loose co collection of stars. There is one strange feature about it, which you, maybe you can just about see it in this picture here, which is that this is the, the, a fairly close up view of the star cluster. Maybe you can see there's a kind of a, a dearth of stars, a lack of stars in kind of a ring about there, and then there's more stars further out. So it's tough, right? I've got this roughly spherical collection of stars, and I want there to be a lack of them in a ring when I just view a pic and take a picture of it. That essentially means you need a cylinder of nothingness as you go through it. And not only does it have to be a cylinder of nothingness, but it has to be pointing exactly at you. Like you, like you smashed it with a big cookie cutter. That's, yeah, exactly. You've knocked all those stars out and in, in exactly the right direction so that you can see right through it and see nothing in that particular direction. And that makes astronomers very uncomfortable, right? Because firstly, because, well, how on earth do you make a cylindrical borehole through this thing? Um, and secondly, why would it be pointing directly at the Earth? You now, you really have just cut out a particular annulus of the thing and you've left the rest you left the stuff inside and the stuff outside. That's probably unlikely. So the, it turns out there's an easier way to make round things on the sky, which is an easy way to make a round thing on the si sky is actually to have a, a spherical shell. So just a, 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 a spherical collection of nothingness. Right? And so because if you've got a sphere, although if you think about it, although there's bits of it you know, in the middle along the line of sight and at the edges of it along the line of sight, in the middle, you're only looking through the front and back face, so you're not looking through much of the sphere. On the edges, you're looking all the way through all that thickness of the shell. And so one way to make round things on the sky is to actually have something which is intrinsically, intrinsically spherical. So we've actually seen this already in the Messier catalog when we're looking at planetary nebulae. There's things like the ring nebula, which look round, but actually they're spherical, and it's just you see the edges much more brightly. And in this case, it's, it looks like there's a, a, a spherical shell of nothingness in this particular cluster of stars. And it stands out dramatically where you're looking through a lot of that spherical shell of nothingness. You see really very few stars. And it's still there in the front and back face, but actually there's still plenty of stars in the middle, so it doesn't really stand out there. So it's a bit like, a, it's like the nebula, but in reverse. It's like a negative. It's like, an, exactly like. It's a, like a negative of the nebula that you've taken stuff away rather than adding stuff in. Alternatively, you could have a spherical shell of obscuring material. So actually there are stars in it, but they're actually largely obscured by the fact that there's all this obscuring dust and, so, and soot and so on. Again, something we've seen in various objects that we've looked at. And again, you see the same effect because on the front and back edge, you're looking through the obscuring material, but not very much of it. And so actually it doesn't have much effect. But along the edges, you're looking through this huge thickness of this obscuring material. So you really, you can't see through it. And so you wouldn't see any of the stars in it. And so it really would appear dark. And in fact, there are ways of making exactly that, a spherical shell of material, which you could be expanding outwards from some fairly gentle explosion. In this case, it would probably be associated with a star formation. So maybe you, you could convince yourself, yes, actually, we can make this shell of, of expanding material. It's easier than somehow excavating all the stars from that nice, neat spherical shell and then keeping it that way long enough to actually see it. It turns out, though, it doesn't work, strangely enough. So if we go back, so let's go to the original paper. James Cuffey from 1940 wrote this paper. One of uh, about a couple of clusters, one of which is our object, um, because uh, Messier 26 is also known as NGC 6694. So he analysed this cluster, and so, for example, here's a plot he made showing the number of stars that you see as you kind of just... He just took some photos and counted the number of stars, and it's the number of stars you see 
as you work your way out in radius, sort of the, the density of them in the sky. So there's lots of them in the middle, and then it drops off, and then there's this dip where there's very few, and then it comes back up again, and then it dips back down, and this is just sort of the general level of stars in the sky anyway. And so you can, this, this is a way very graphically of seeing this ring, that you can see there is this dip, and then there's more stars outside it. Uh, but he pointed out, so what, one of the things he was actually interested in doing was calculating the distance to this cluster of stars. The simple way to calculate the distance to clusters of stars is looking at the brightness of the stars and using what you know about the properties of stars to then figure out how far away it is. He looked at these two hypotheses as to whether it's just an empty shell or whether it's a shell of obscuring material. And he said if, if there is this shell of obscuring material, then actually the stars in the middle, you will see them through the first the front surface of this obscuring shell. And so the stars in the middle should appear fainter than the stars out in the outer parts of the cluster. And so if you then naively use those brightnesses to figure out the distance to the cluster, you end up with this rather strange result that the stars in the middle are fainter and therefore you infer that the middle of the cluster is further away than the outskirts, um, which would be a very clear signature that you're actually seeing some kind of obscuration. And he actually did the calculations of figuring out the distances to this cluster and found actually the middle of the cluster is exactly the same distance away as the outer parts of the cluster, from which he concluded that actually there can't be any obscuring material in the spherical shell in this kind of picture, and he came to the conclusion that it really somehow has to be a sh an empty shell, a shell where there just aren't very many stars. What could cause that? I honestly don't know. And actually the weird thing is, so usually we think about these clusters of stars with the stars on fairly random orbits. They're not going around in any particularly orderly fashion. It's like a swarm of bees. Everything's orbiting in a fairly random fashion. And that means that stars which are just outside that shell, some of them will be travelling outwards and they'll travel into it. Stars that are, that are further out, some of them will be travelling inwards and they'll travel, travel in, into it. It's very hard to maintain anything with sharp edges like a shell like this in a system where you've got everything going around on random orbits because it will just fill in with stars. So I honestly don't know what the answer is in this case. Either you have a very strange arrangement of, of the orbits of the stars so that they somehow manage to avoid that spherical shell, or it really is just a coincidence. There isn't really a shell there at all and your eyes just being fooled and, and it's just a sort of a, a, a mathematical fluke, a statistical fluke that you happen to see it as an empty shell at the moment. Because there is the, the sh this chance that this could just be a statistical effect and it's not then it's hard to get that excited about it because you could spend you know, several years of your life coming up with a clever orbital model that would explain it and then it turns out actually it was just a statistical aberration anyway. There's nothing really physical about it. When you do find something really bizarre, you generally really want to explain it because actually sometimes finding the really strange objects out there and understanding how they work gives you much better insight as to how things work in general. But in other cases, you know, explaining some little oddity doesn't really actually take you any further in understanding the subject overall. And there it's probably not waste, worth wasting a huge amount of time studying it in order to just to explain that one object. Supernovae go off. I mean, typically a supernova like this goes off once every 20, 30 years in a galaxy. When there's less people around and when you go a little further, you feel like you're on Mars because of the landscape and it's, it's fantastic. So, and then all of these antennas around, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's just beautiful.